Hey fellow babies, welcome back to this week's Pactor Factor on Sifted.net. If you're watching as a Patreon patron, thank you so much, you're getting it real time. If you're watching on YouTube, you're getting it a week late, and I know it's free, but if you're a freebie person, at the minimum, would you please link your Amazon Prime account, your Twitch account, there's a link right below the picture. Click it, it's easy, we get 250, it costs you nothing. Uh, first question this week from Patreon from Kamikaze. Hi Michael, now that Epic is being very aggressive in gathering third party exclusives, how do you think Valve will respond on Steam? Will it start going after exclusives, lower its cut to what, what Epic is offering, or make more of its own games? Boy, the last one, make more of its own games. Yeah, <laughs> Half-Life 3, Half-Life 3 coming next week because that's how they're gonna respond. Um, look, uh, I'd, say, I'd say that, first of all, uh, Epic doesn't really have exclusives. Epic has timed exclusives. So everything I've seen uh, is they're gonna launch first on Epic. That makes sense. If you know, if you're paying a 12% royalty versus 30, give the guy who's giving you a discount early access to the game. You can't abandon Steam as a publisher because Steam is great. It's got hundreds of millions of users, and you know they're going to distribute your games. And 30% is not unreasonable. I mean, the amount that Steam charges is what Apple charges, is what you know Amazon charges for pay-per-view movies or VOD movies. Um, it is a totally reasonable fee. Epic is cutting the fee, and so they get rewarded. They're going to get content early. Valve is not going to re respond to this at all, unless they see a decline in their business. So if Valve, let's just say, is doing $500 million a year in game downloads and making 30%, $150 million, if that drops to $400 million, yeah, they'll respond. If it drops to $480, they're not going to cut the rate from 30% to 8 to 12%. That wouldn't make any sense at all. They'd be giving money away. So they're gonna see what happens. Um, I think it's interesting that Epic finds itself flush with cash and decides to take on the giant in the game's download business. They might be able to pull this off. I, I got news for you. Valve has more money than Epic does. Now give it another year or two, maybe Epic's gonna have more money, but the Valve guys, they've been generating profits for years and years and years and years. And the Epic guys, I understand, are paying it out to their owners, you know, to their shareholders and owners and employees. So I'm not sure that they really have that much cash. They might have 500 million a year to spend. Valve generates easily, you know, all in 500 million and, and they'll fight back. Um, so my bias is no, you won't get a massive cut. Um, Valve might, you know, drop the, the, their cut to 25% and Epic raise their, their piece to 20 to compete because they're not making money at 12. Um, the game developers and publishers love competition. It's great. If you get to keep more of your money, awesome. Um, exclusives, you're only going to give them an exclusive if they pay you. So you might see Steam offer a 12% download rate if somebody puts an exclusive on Steam. That could happen. But I don't think you're going to get a lot of differentiated content on either service. Um, they'll put their own stuff on, obviously. But third-party content, if you're a third party, you want the most distribution possible. So you're not going to limit your distribution outlet to one or the other. Uh, so again, let's, let's give it some time. Let's see if the Epic Store grows into a force and takes on Steam. My, my bias is they're about 2% the size of Steam right now. Next question from Sifted from Derek D111. Hi, Mr. Pactor. I remember as a kid, movies, food, and almost everything else was way less expensive than it is now, but video game prices have stayed the same. Wow. Games are far more expensive to create now, but they stayed around 60. Why is this? Ooh, what a good question. Um, scale is the answer. And you know, you, you, you mentioned things that have gone up, but um, like movies and food, but like car prices, you know, really haven't gone up as much as many other things compared to what you get for, for what you pay. So I remember back in the 80s buying a car and I paid, I remember, I paid $24,000 for a Volvo 740 Turbo, which was a pretty fast car. And I don't even know if it had electric windows. <laughs> um, now, you can get a similar car to that now, 30 years later, for about $40,000. And it's gonna have front and back cameras. You know, it's gonna have GPS built in. It's gonna have integrated, you know, much better stereo, much safer car. Um, heavier, better built, 
Um, so you can, if you could have bought all that stuff back in the 80s, it would have cost 40,000 um, bucks. You're getting 16,000 more value for about 40. So it, it, no, I, I mean, even cars haven't really gone up. And so I think that the reason is there's fewer car manufacturers like Saab doesn't exist anymore. Um, there's much more demand because the world has expanded the number of people who drive. Um, games are the same way. There's less competition and games sell many, many, many more units. So the development cost of a game, let's just say, it's 50 million bucks to make a game. Well, if you sell 1 million copies at 60 bucks, you lost money. Your development cost, you didn't get your development cost back. So back in the day when games were 60 bucks 20 years ago, you made a game and it probably cost about 10 million bucks to make. And you had to sell about, you know, two, three million copies, you would make plenty of money. Now games cost 50 million as much as 100 million to make. You have to sell three, four million copies to break even. So a game like Mafia 3, I think it sold four and a half million units. It probably literally broke even. I mean, that's, that's about exactly enough recovery after marketing and, and you know, distribution expense. Um, so you got to really sell four or five million bucks, units, excuse me, to break even. The good news is games like Call of Duty sell 25 million units. And, you know, the studio, it's 200 people, three years, 60 million bucks to make. That's really what it costs. There's some bonuses and stuff involved, but you sell 25 million copies and you spent 60 million in development, it's $2, two point two dollars per copy in R&D cost. That's nothing. So they don't have to raise the price because they're not spending very much percentage wise on R&D. Um, so th the answer is that, uh, the other thing is the console manufacturers kind of like games at about 60. Um, I think, I mean the same is true of movies. You know, movie movies, the cost of development scales with the likely revenue. So a movie like Black Panther or uh, Avengers Endgame, they'll spend 200 million bucks making the movie because they know they're gonna do a billion dollars a box office. Um, they don't spend you know, 200 million dollars making Us, you know, which is the Jordan Peele movie. I don't know what he spent, but probably 30. I mean, he, yeah. Like, yeah, they're gonna make their money yeah. back. Yeah, they're gonna make their money back because they, they, they gauge the cost of development with the likely sales. That's still true in the game world as well. So you get you know smaller games, but again, you have a lot of indie games, 10, 15 million bucks, um, you know, 10, 10, 15, 10, 15 million dollars of development cost, and they only expect to sell a couple of million copies of a $15 download. Um, but again, I can't really give you the why. Um, movies have gone up because uh, box office attendance is down. Box office attendance is down because there's so many different ways to see a movie so you know the because you can rent the movie later watch it on vod uh, watch it on cable tv H, hbo or stars or watch it on netflix more people see the movie in the aggregate but box office is lower so you know, attendance not overall box office so the turnstile doesn't turn as often so they have to charge more to keep the theaters open that's just the scale there food uh shockingly when you said food Things like steak have gone up and chicken have gone up. Um, things like produce have gone down. It's shocking how cheap it is. Uh, stuff like, again, you don't, you don't remember this when you were a kid, you didn't pay attention. I remember as a kid, we saw, I saw a kiwi for the first time when I was about 10. And we bought a kiwi and I really liked it. And I remember telling my mom a couple months later, could we get more kiwis? And she was like, no, they're not in season anymore. You don't get those at the store. Guess what? We get those year round now. So, um, no, it's amazing because you used to pay up a lot. Avocados used, used to be like ridiculous because they were seasonal. Grapefruit. I remember you could only get grapefruit a few months a year. You know, now because of southern and northern hemisphere, when it's not grapefruit season in the northern hemisphere, it is in the southern hemisphere. So we, in California, we get grapes and, and bananas and shit from Chile. You know, because they're just like California, they have avocados and almonds and they grow stuff year round. And so we take advantage and we ship that stuff back and forth and it's actually cheaper because you have access to it all year round and it's crazy. Anyway, go, go shop at Walmart and tell me if their prices have gone up. They really have not. Our next question from YouTube from Ray J. King. You can call me Ray, you can call me Jay, you can call me Ray J. 
You remember that one? You probably don't. Um, <laughs> you gotta be, be old to remember you, that. You gotta be old to remember that. Yeah. Johnson's right. Oh, you can call me Ray, or you can call me Jay. Well, you can For a great Johnson. tasting light you beer, just say natural. But you doesn't have to call me Johnson. Ray J. King, uh, reviews from major outlets have a noticeable impact on the commercial success of games. Why don't game developers and publishers work with game reviewers to make the perfect game? So Nguy Kroll has a service, um, I know a bunch of guys who do this, and they, they beta test games before they're public beta, and they go through it, they look at the features, they kind of match the features and tell the developers what works and what doesn't work and how it will be received. God knows if they're good at it, I think they are, they're all in business and they're thriving, but the publishers try really hard. What the publishers don't want to do is they don't want to be viewed as paying off the, the reviewers. So the problem is the closer the relationship with reviewers, the reviewer then begins to look biased. And it's one thing to give them an early build and ask their opinion, it's another thing to give them an early build, which is like a favor to the reviewer. Hey, hey, you're the guy who's getting favored, and if you don't give us a good review, we won't let you do that next time. So it's a really fine line between you know, bribing the, and I'm bribing, I mean it not in the illegal sense, but, but giving them an incentive to give you good reviews so they'll get more access. Access provides incentive and it's hard. So um, I go through this in my business. I mean, I, you know, I get paid to have an opinion about companies and yet I also get paid if the company managements visit with my clients and the company managements don't visit clients if the analyst has a sell rating on the stock. So I have a sell on Netflix. I haven't had management visit investors since I had a sell rating. And in fairness, I wouldn't ask them to because I know the answer is going to be no, but they never offer. As opposed to, you know, I had a neutral rating on take two for a few years, no management access. I upgraded to buy because I genuinely think it's a buy and I like the stock and I like the company. And boom, they said, hey, when can we go marketing with you? Wow. Now, they didn't do it first. So I'm giving, I mean, giving take two massive credit here. They didn't say, hey, we'll go marketing with you if you upgrade. And I didn't ask them and I didn't think you know, that they would go with me when I was neutral. But as soon as I upgraded, they rewarded me, which is great. I think it's a great technique. They should do that. It's totally legal. It's not a bribe, but not just them, all companies. I have now, I got the message, hey, when you have a buy, they market with you. When you don't, so what? I still get paid to have an opinion about the company. And if they're not a buy, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna um, upgrade them just to get a management road trip. That let somebody else do that. But investors are skeptical of analysts who take companies around because they wonder if they're giving them a high rating just for the, uh, you know, for the road trip. So again, I don't expect companies have limited time. They can only give you as much time, and when they give you time, you, know, you appreciate it. But you know, it's, there's the quid pro quo is. If you have a buy on the stock, they go with you. If you don't, they don't. That's what I think would happen if the major, if the publishers uh, and developers work with game reviewers. It would look like we're working with you because we expect a good review, and if you give us a bad review, we're cutting you off, and we'll never, you know, give you anything again. Um, I remember a story. I'll leave the publisher and developer out of this. Of, of Jim Sterling giving a game an 80 that had a consistent 90s Metacritic score. And I understand he hasn't been invited back to get an early review copy of that. that Publishers, yeah. That's not an anomaly. Yeah, so that's what they do. Or they won't invite you to their launch party or whatever. They punish you, and he gave them an 80. You know, they punish you if you give them a bad review. Okay, uh, from Sifted, from SJ0S. Will you play anything on the Nintendo Switch this year? If so, which game? My God, I am so not a Pokemon player. Um, I don't know what else. I hate Smash Brothers too, and not because it's a bad game. I suck at it. So I don't hate their games, I hate fighting games. So Smash Brothers, no, won't ever play it. And Pokemon, just not my thing. And I have to say, like, you know, two years ago, I would have said Stardew Valley, bleh, and I loved it, right. you know, so. And Golf Story, I didn't love, but I liked, you know, so like, I'm sure that, I, the answer is I'm sure there will be some independent title that I don't know about yet that'll come out. And the way I figured out Stardew Valley, um, Gary Witta was like, going, just drooling on himself. You guys gotta play this game, this game is amazing. And I played it, I was like, it is really great. And actually I talked to Jeremy Hoffman, he's like, play it, it's great. 
you know, so I, yes, I don't know which one. Sorry, I wish I could tell you. Um, it is not my platform of choice. Um, I play it randomly. I still haven't taken it with me on an airplane. I know, because I just don't want to take it back. I travel most, I should have taken it to Australia. You gotta get I, a travel case, it makes it. Yeah, and I'm afraid to break it, and I, like, not even the, the screen as much as the Joy-Cons. You know, like I have a PC uh, sleeve in my, in my bag with padding on either side of it, so I could put it in there, but the Joy-Cons, I'm afraid of crack. Uh, really? Tough, yeah. Okay, I don't know. I agree. Anyway, uh, no. Thank you for joining us on this week's Pactor Factor. Uh, I am Michael Pactor. You are already following me on Twitter at Michael Pactor. If not, start following me. Uh, appreciate your patronage on Patreon. Appreciate if you're not a patron that you are linking your Twitch account to your Amazon Prime account so we can get paid from Amazon. It costs you nothing. Click the damn link. And again, follow us on Twitter if you're not doing anything else. See you next week.